Good evening, and thank you for joining us for our Bible study lesson tonight. Tonight, we're going to be blessed with a lesson from Pastor Micah Dobbins. But before we get into our lesson, we will have a word of prayer over the lesson and greetings to everybody who has tuned in. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Welcome to our new subscribers. Thank you so much for being a part of our online community. I'm going to open with a word of prayer. Then we will hear our announcements, and then you will hear a word of God from the man of God. Let us be agreed in prayer. Father, we thank you for allowing us to come together, even on this platform, Lord, to share your word. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, and we invite you into this hour of our learning today. Bless our hearts to hear, Lord, our minds to understand, Lord, and receive the truth that you are given to your church today. Lord, I ask that you would remove every distraction and everything that will hinder us from hearing your word. Father, I ask also that you would remember those who are not feeling well in their bodies today. Lord, those that may not be feeling their best in their spirits today, may you uplift them, Father God. May they find the healing that they need for body and soul in Christ Jesus. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray and we ask all these things. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to COG Mission YouTube channel. You can meet us here live on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. and Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. If you want to give to this ministry, you may do so by Cash App at Cash App COG Mission 01 or PayPal. Just type in Church of God Mission at att.net. For more information about this ministry, to share your testimony or prayer concern, please contact us at COG My Testimony at gmail.com. You may also visit our website at cogmission.org. Good evening, saints. We praise God for each and every one of you tuning in today. We thank God um, for this platform where we're able to share the word of God with you. And we just want to open with a brief word of prayer as we prepare for our lesson tonight. Ye are the light of the world. So let us be agreed. Father, we thank you. Lord, again, for us coming together, we thank you, Father, for your word, Father God, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We pray right now in the name of Jesus that, Lord, you would, Lord, remember me, thy, your speaker today. We pray, Father God, that you would remember your people right now, Father God, at home and those that may be listening, whether they be at work or in their car, Lord, or if they're at school or wherever they are this very hour, we just pray in the name of Jesus that as they're watching this video, Lord, may your word go forth, Father God, to be a blessing unto them. Lord, may it help us, Lord, to move up higher in thee. We pray, Father God, that you would bind the power of the enemy. We plead the blood against him. That, Lord, he would not be able to distract or rob not one thought. And we thank you, Father God, Lord, for your love for us, for you sending your son Jesus to die on a cruel cross, that we may be saved. Bless us, Father God, as we attempt to move up in thee and to walk in this holy way. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. Amen. Amen. All right, saints. So, we want to go ahead and open up in our first scripture, which is going to be found in John, the first chapter. We'll be reading verses 4 through 5 and then 9 through 13 as we get into our lesson tonight. So John, the first chapter, verses 4 through 5. Um, and just for context, we know this is very familiar at the mission where it talks about in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. But in light of our text we want to jump down to verse 4 that just says in him was life and the life was the light of men speaking of Jesus and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not so the Bible says that in him meaning in Jesus 
And I, I just want to go ahead, since we're already here, let's just go ahead and back it up to verse 3 so that we can get even more clarity um, as we build up this lesson tonight. It says, all things were made by him, meaning all things were made by Jesus. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And when you drop down to verse 9, it talks about Jesus again. It says, that was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And he came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So, opening up in the scripture, we see that all things were made by Jesus, for Jesus, and without him was not anything made that was made. By him all things are able to consist. And it talks about how he was the life and the light of men. And it says he's that true light that came into the world. That he came into darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. They didn't receive him. Uh, they weren't open to the message. Uh, many turned away that day when Jesus walked the earth and began to share. And we know that there are some that were seeking him. Um, when he first came, we know John the Baptist and others that were looking for him, and Simeon and Anna, the prophetess and things. And we know that by and by that he did have his disciples that followed, and there were others that did follow. But just in context of this verse, it's letting us know that light shines in the darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. He went into his own, and his own received him not. But those who did receive him, he gave them power to become the sons of God. They began to be children of light. And I want to give you a few scriptures kind of help as we're discussing this so that you have a better understanding when we talk about us being the light of the world, just as Jesus is the light of the world. So from there, we want to go to James, the first chapter, verses 17 through 18. And James is a very good book, but here we want to pick out these two verses. It says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begot he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So the scripture lets us know that all the good gifts and the perfect gifts that come, they come from above. God allows it to rain on the just and the unjust, the sun to shine on the just and the unjust, and all good things come from him. It says, and it cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, and that he begat us with the word of truth. We know Jesus was the word that was made flesh, that was the light, and we became a kind of first fruits of his creatures. We began to be um, in the image of God. We know the Bible tells us in Genesis, when he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and he breathed the breath of life in man. And out of all the animals and everything else he created, man was the only one that he breathed the breath of life in and became a living soul. But God wanted visible expressions of himself and he wanted us to be children of light. And Jesus was the light that lighted every man that cometh into the world. So now through Jesus living in us and being born again and being children of God and adopted, joined heirs with Christ, we become lights. And our father is the father of lights. And we're able to shine in a dark, decaying world as the light. Proverbs 20 and 27 says, The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. When you start speaking of a candle, a candle produces light. When you are in a room and it's dark, maybe your power goes out or something is going on, you know, electrical storm, etc., we get candles, we get the matches, we light them up because we need to what? See where we're going. We want to be able to see in the bathroom. We want to be able to see in the cupboard. We want to be able to see us in the closet. Or if we're going outside and it's nighttime, you got a flashlight or something because you don't want to stumble over a rock or hurt your toe. You don't want to be in darkness. You want to see the light. You want to be able to have a visual understanding of what's going on around you. When you go into a closet or a cupboard, and it's dark. You can't see the corners of the dirt or whatever is in there that shouldn't be there. But when you cut on the light, you're able to see that, oh, this needs to be cleaned up. 
that needs to be put away. This needs to be thrown out. We need to make some changes up in here. But that light is what helps you to see that, that the darkness is trying to hide. And he's letting us know that the spirit of man is a candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. We read earlier, there's no shadow of turning or no variableness with God. He says, I am the Lord, I change not. God is light and in him is no darkness. We can't say that we're walking in light and hating our brother or say that we're in the light and walking in darkness of disobedience. We, we lie. We're not speaking the truth. We, we want to make sure we're having fellowship, true fellowship with him. We have to walk in the light as he's the light and he's trying to get us to stay in the light and to be children of the light. So when God shines a light in your path, as the old saints used to say, you walk in it. We sing the song, walk in the light, beautiful light. Because we want to make sure that we are right in his sight and that we're obedient to all the Holy Spirit commands for us to do. So we want to pick up from there from John 8 and 12. It says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So, Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. If you follow me, you're not going to walk in darkness. You won't have the light of life. And there are many out there that may say, well, what about people who do, you know, this good deed or that good deed? Or what about, you know, people, who, you know, they seem to have a good heart. You know, they're, they're trying to be a light, to be an example. Jesus said, I'm the light. If you walk in me, you're not going to be in darkness. You will have true light if you're in Jesus. If you're not in Jesus, you don't have the light. You're yet in darkness. This world is yet in darkness. Until one has been born again. Until he confess with his mouth, believe in his heart. Because you can't even see the kingdom of God if you haven't done such. Until you're born again and saved, you're in darkness. And when you're born again and he begins to shine light in your path, as I stated earlier, you begin to walk in it. He begins to help you to modify your behaviors, to change from the old person you used to be to the new creature in Christ Jesus that he calls you to be. So he let it be known that anybody who follows me shall not walk in darkness. The same way there is no shadow of turning or variableness in the nature of God, we don't have no dark light saints. We don't have no saying some I got darkness in me and light in me and I'm kind of, you know, in between or I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm gothic, I'm a dark Christian. No, it don't work like that. You're going to be the light as he's the light. When you look at some of the sayings of this world versus the wisdom of God and the scripture, Jesus said that if any man follow him, that there's no darkness in him. We're not running around tomorrow. I got two different wolves living in me, a good wolf or a bad wolf, and whichever one you feed is the dark wolf or the light wolf. Who winning? Oh, I got an angel on this show, the devil on this show, like them silly cartoons. No, 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 no. You want to be led of the Spirit, and you want the candle of the Lord to be lit in your heart to be bright. You want to be able to say, as David said, I'm hiding your word in my heart so I don't sin against you, Lord. You know, uh, don't cast me away from your presence. Don't take your spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. We want to make sure that we're following all that God requires and allowing him to illuminate us from the inside out so that we could be a light and an example to a dying world, that we may be able to help the unbelievers to see the truth of the word and that they too may want to serve Jesus and to turn their lives over to him. If you look at Matthew 5, 13 through 15, Jesus again says, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick that it giveth light unto all that are in the house. So again, Jesus letting us know, first thing he says, look, you're the salt of the earth. When you think about that salt, um, you know, there are many meats and foods and fish and vegetables and things you could eat. But without salt, it's bland. It don't really have a taste. Without the seasoning, you know, people joke about that, but without the seasoning, you know, you may not enjoy that food, <laughs> those nutrients <laughs> that you need to receive. It's just not as good when it don't taste good so he's saying listen you're the salt of the earth the saints are what makes life worth living having the saints on the earth is why the earth is still standing if all the saints were gone and, and, and to leave 
There would be no point of this, this celestial ball being here right now. There would be no purpose of it. But because the saints are here, there's still a hope. But don't, don't make no mistake about it. There's going to come a time where he's going to call his saints home. Jesus is going to come and he's going to take them out of the four corners of the earth. And this earth is going to melt with fervent heat. The elements and the works thereof are going to be destroyed. And after that, the judgment. You're either going to go to heaven or hell. You can't miss both. But he says, that, listen, you're the salt of the earth. And if it lost its savior, then, then where was it to be salted? It's good for nothing. It's only to be trodden under the foot of men. And what is that telling us? As the saints of God, we don't want to lose our, our zest, our zeal, our excitement for God. We don't want to lose that uh, fire burning inside and trying to be a light and following after him. We don't want to allow the enemy to fan us asleep or to cool us off or to be like that that was amongst the thorns or, or the wayside or the seeds that the fowls came and snatched up. We want to be that good ground that we could grow thereby so that we can continue to be the salt of the earth and not lose our flavor so that we're good for nothing but to be trod under the foot of men. And then again, he says, now ye are the light of the world. You can't be a Christian and be hiding and not be willing to go through. Taking up your cross was one of the prerequisites in following him after you denied yourself. So we have to follow that same formula Jesus taught to be the saints that we're called to be. And we are a city set on a hill that can't be hid. When people are going through a valley or a low experience and you got that city on the hill with the light shining, it becomes a beacon and they can see what's going on from a distance and find their way. But when you decide you don't want to be a city set on a hill, you want to hide under a bushel, you're you going you gonna to dry out, you're going to lose your fire, you're going to be good for nothing. So we want to make sure that we're being that example and being that light. And being the light means in all places, both public and private. When you're at your job, you need to be the light. When you're in school or you're in those public places, you should be the light. It's a sad day when there are people that can work with you and they not know that you're a Christian or that you have a standard of God, that you're raising up a holy standard. There, there's something wrong with that. It ought not be that you go to school and people are shocked when somebody says they go to church. You know they're a Christian, right? He's a Christian. She's a Christian. It shouldn't be a surprise. They should be able to know based off your lifestyle, your chaste conversation, that you there's something different about them. And sometimes they'll say that. They'll, they might use profanity. And after a while, through conversing with you, realize you, you don't curse and you're not saying the words that they're saying or the colorful language. And they'll say, oh, you know what? Part of my French or excuse me or I know you don't say these kind of things. I'm sorry. Well, I'll, uh, uh, excuse me. You know, and or they'll ask you flat out. Are you a Christian? You must be a child of God. You must go to church. You must be religious. You got faith or something because they're going to realize you're not getting down with what they're with. You're not listening to the music they're listening to. And you're not doing the things that they're doing and following after the course of this world. And it's not that we're, um, you know, just feeling like we just way better than you. No, we once did run after the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air. But by the grace of God, we're born again. We're saved. We've been washed, cleaned, and sanctified. And we no longer do those things. We don't run in excess of riot with the world anymore when we've repented of our sins and we're following the spirit so that we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh we change and we become lights in all places in all areas i want to give you um a scripture first peter two and nine. First peter two and nine just reads as following it says but ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It says you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. You're supposed to stand out and be different, saints of God. And he says that, that you were called out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We ought not be walking in darkness if we name the name of a saint. We are to be lights of the world. And if you don't know, the world is a very dark place. The world right now is a very dark place. We have young people that are confused about what they were created for or who they're supposed to be. There are those that uh, deal with what they call uh, gender dysphoria. They don't understand whether they, well, am I a man, am I a woman, a woman and a man, or what's going on with me? There are those that don't have um, uh, intrinsic self-worth or love. 
because they haven't been loved by their parents or loved by those around, so they don't know what true unconditional love is from the Father that we should have for our hearts, one for another, for the saints. There are those that are, are going through as just driftwood on life's sea, and they're groping in the darkness, tripping and stumbling all their lives, hoping for a better day to come, but it seems like only trouble and calamity is in their path until you shine that light to give them the hope and to see Jesus in your life. But if you sit there hiding it under a bushel, my Lord, how will they find their way? God wants to use us to be his hands and his feet. We need to go out and be the mouthpiece and be the one that is trying to be examples for the unbelievers to follow. In Luke 11, 33 through 36, it says, No man, when he hath lighted a candle, put it in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that they which come in may see the light. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if thine eye be single, thy whole body also is full of light. But when the eye is evil, the body also is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. If thy whole body, therefore, be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. So reading from another gospel, just getting a deeper understanding of being the light and what Jesus was saying in these parables. He again is letting you know you don't light a candle and put it in a secret place. You light it so you can see where you're going, so you can see what's really out there. And he said that they which come in will be able to see the light. They'll see the light in your life. They'll see the Jesus in you, and it can help them to want to be a part. It'll help them to want to be saved, to put down the bottle and quit drinking, to stop fornicating and, and adulterating and cussing and carrying on. They'll want to quit stealing and lying and cheating and want to walk uprightly when they see you being an example to the unbeliever and introducing them to Jesus and showing them the unconditional love of God. Then he says that the light of the body is the eye. We have to be careful what we allow our eyes to look at or what we partake of. The Bible tells us, they love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Then it says, all that's in the world are the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. So again, we see those eyes. We have to make sure that our eye be single so that the body could be full of light. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. Our eye need to be single for God and for Him only. Because when we begin to allow this world to allure us, through the lust of the eye, then the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, then the body can quickly become full of darkness if our eye becomes evil. So we want our eyes to be full of light. And he says, you need to take heed, therefore, to that light which be in thee, be not darkness. Don't deceive yourself, saints. Move up higher in him. He says, because if the whole body is full of light, having no part dark, he don't want you having darkness in you, claiming to have light. We can't say we love God and hate our brother. We can't say we love God and that we, we, we cuss and using his name in vain. Or that we love God, but we hate being around the saints in the church. Because I just don't like them church folk. You a lie, the devil told you. You need to repent. You need to get to let it go. He said, if your eye be single, you're going to be full of light. Having no dark part, then the whole is going to be full of light. And it's going to be bright. Just like a candle shining gives you light, you'll be bright. Illuminating those lives you come in contact with. People will see you coming, and they'll recognize you as a beacon of hope. A joy to be around now don't uh, get it twisted eventually by and by they'll grow tired of your light if they want darkness because the Bible's true men love darkness rather than light and after a while they'll turn on you and will be offended in you by and by because you are the light and the example you're the reminder that whatever they're doing or whatever lifestyle they're in is not pleasing to God and they may even say things like, I feel like you're judging me or you're judgmental. You're looking down on me. But we're not looking to, to diss you like that. We just want to share with you the truth of God's word and the judgments of God. The Bible lets us know um, that, you know, they're condemned already. They're not saved, born again, in the light. They're not with Jesus. You're already condemned already. Um, yeah, this is why we need to share the word with all those who are here. Because there is now no condemnation in them that are in Christ Jesus. Those that crucify the flesh with its affections and lusts that are walking after the spirit. We, we don't have to worry about that condemnation. But for those who are still doing wickedness and wrong, yes, 
um, there is a, a condemnation with that and hopefully us being the light and showing love will help you to see the errors of sin that you may repent and overcome it because Jesus said you must be born again if you're not born again you can't even see the kingdom of God so you got to be saved so that you can be part of this fellowship and be the light now being in the light means we have to expose the darkness saints of God we've had even just recently a situation where there are those in our movement being challenged desiring us to affirm lifestyles that the Bible clearly condemns asking uh, saints to repent and to go along with same-sex relationships and to allow them to be in positions um, held for those that live a holy life a clean life you know to be an elder to be a, a preacher a pastor a minister is a high calling and God wants you to take this serious you know make your calling and election sure and it's not to be taken lightly or just titles to be thrown around for men to kind of one up each other and to feel like well now I've arrived because I'm a bishop I'm a deacon I'm a pastor I'm an elder uh, whatever else they're calling themselves these days but we want to make sure that those that are trying to fulfill those titles and things that they are truly saved born again living a clean life and no you cannot be in a same-sex relationship no you cannot be a part of that alphabet community and still want to be in a position of leadership within the church of God and and this is why we have to be the light to let the darkness know that we're not gonna lie to bring that in and make no mistake about it it's not just the homosexuals that are trying to get in those that ought not be there the adulterating ones ought not be in that position the fornicating the lying and the cheating ones those that are committing sins against God they, they ought not be in those positions either um, you need to be born again, you need to repent, you need to walk in newness of life, and you need to forsake sin. For sin should not have dominion over you, and being made free from sin, you have your fruits unto holiness. You should be walking in holiness and allowing the Spirit to lead and guide you um, to fill those offices. But being the light means, saints of God, we must expose the darkness. There's no way around this. If you're going to be the light, light repels darkness. When I cut on a light in this room, darkness flees. It leaves. It goes somewhere. When you shine a light in a dark hallway, that light going to go all the way down. That darkness going to spread out, out the light's way. And likewise, um, we need to be the light so the darkness can flee. And there are those that will want to be part of the light, will join the light, and be saved. So Matthew 10, being the light, we expose darkness. I want to share a couple of scriptures. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 27 and 28, what I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him that is able to destroy both the soul and body in hell. There are those that are afraid or fearful to speak out. They're afraid to share the truth because of what man may do to them and what people could do. But Jesus said, don't fear them which can kill only the body. You need to be afraid of him that can destroy both the body and soul into hell. Fear God more. Honor God more. When the apostles were arrested and beaten and threatened not to preach in Jesus' name, and Peter them let them know that whether to honor God or man, uh, what you think is right. You tell us, we're going to honor God. We're going to continue on, and we'll read that a little later. But what I want you to have understanding of is that you don't need to be afraid of people. You need to be the light and share the truth, even if it's the boss, even if it's that love interest or whoever it is you call yourself being friends and bosom buddies with, don't be afraid to tell the truth and fearing them which can only kill the body. He says, what I tell you in darkness, speak in the light. You need to share it. Let it be known. And he says that that which you hear in the ear, you need to preach it upon the rooftop. We need to shout it from the highest places to let people know that, yes, God still reigns. Holiness is still right. There is a better life and a better way. And that you can overcome sin. You don't have to continue in the lowlands of sin any longer. Jesus, our Redeemer, came to pay it all and to save his people from their sins. And we have to let people know that. And exposing the darkness means telling people the truth, even when they don't want to hear. Ephesians 5, 10 and 11 says, Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So Paul writing to the Ephesian church, let him know, listen, you need to prove, excuse me, you need to prove what is acceptable 
unto the Lord. There are those that feel like they can come to God any old kind of way. We saw that with Cain and Abel. God received one and rejected the other. No, we need to prove what is acceptable unto the Lord. God does not accept all these things. When we read in Isaiah, and they were bringing those vain oblations and sacrifices to God, he said, who, who has required this of thee? Who told you to bring this to me? Enough, I cannot away with. He said, your new moons, your Sabbath, your solemn feasts, I hate it. Your solemn meetings, I'm not with it. God was letting them know, I, I want a, a heart service. I want people who truly believe and want to follow me. I don't want people just going through uh, the motions or, you know, just, just doing what mom and daddy think is, this is what we're supposed to be? Okay, this is what we're going to be. This is how we're supposed to do? He wants you to do it from the heart and to love him from the heart and to want to serve and to want to walk in obedience and to allow the Holy Spirit to lead into your life. So, he said, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Which means when they're coming around and speaking about their boyfriend or their girlfriend, and you know they got a spouse, they marry. You got to reprove them, even if it's family. No, you, you're not supposed to have no boyfriend, girlfriend, nobody on the side. You marry. When the young person is saying they want to go move in and they want to fornicate versus do it the right way, because the Bible says, that um, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. Let every woman have her own husband. You need to go in and do it right and get married. If you're going to be there, don't be all touching and stuff. It's not good for a man to touch a woman. You know, these are, 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 are reproving because the reproof is to correct. When the children are dishonoring their mother and father and they're speaking ill of the parent, you know, you reprove, you correct, you let them know you shouldn't be cussing your mother and father. You shouldn't disrespect the elder Honor the ori head. Honor the elder, the gray-haired man. You know, we need to make sure we're reproving them. Don't steal. Don't go rob. Go get a job and work with your hands that you can give to those that have need as the scripture commands. Let them just stole, steal no more. These are scriptures that reprove and correct. And, you know, telling those that are prideful to humble themselves to walk with God. These type of things reprove and correct. And this is what we ought to be doing as the people of God because we're called to do so. But if you go to Hebrews, uh, the third chapter, because we not only want to reprove and correct, we want to make sure that uh, we are a, a part of the building of God, the church of the living God, built upon Jesus Christ, the chief um, cornerstone, and the apostles and prophets, and then we're built upon that foundation. We want to make sure that we're in, that we are a part of the house of that Jesus built. And I was just wanted to point out that Christ is the head of his own house. Excuse me, we're going to go ahead and turn there. Uh, and I, I'll go ahead and start at verse 1, and then we'll drop down. Hebrews 3 and 1 says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. When you consider Jesus in these things, you know, this is our heavenly calling. This is what we're supposed to be doing. You're a holy brethren. He says we need to consider Jesus. And, and, and he let it be known. He says um, in verse 5 and 6. Says, and Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house. Whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of hope firm unto the end. We are a part of that house of Jesus Christ if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of hope firm unto the end. If you're going to be the light, you have to continue to be the light in your journey. You can't allow the light to go out, saints of God. You need to trim your lamps and keep the fire burning bright. Keep the Holy Spirit. Keep the oil so the light can stay lit. We don't need to allow the distractions of this world to come in and to cause us to not be able to be um, fruitful. Or not to be able to be used by the master to where we become unprofitable servants. And he said, Every house that is built, it was built by some man, but he that built it all things is God. God will help build up your most holy faith if you place your hand in his hand and put your trust in his son Jesus, that he's able to help you to hold firm until the end. But make no mistake about it, Christ is the head of his house, and if he says that we're called to be lights, then we must be that if we're going to be right. Being in Christ, we also must overcome sin. When you study in the scripture, 
the Bible tells us time and time again, no matter what mankind is trying to say, no matter what these new uh, up and coming theologians are trying to say, we still hold true to the scriptures that as saints of God, we must overcome sin. The Bible says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? When you are dead to sin, you decide you're going to walk in the light. This is part of the light you got to accept. That how can we live any longer therein if we're dead to sin? He says, the sin shall not have dominion over you. For he that is freed is freed from sin. So we're not supposed to still be dibbling and dabbling in the lowlands of sin and allowing the enemy to pull the wool over our eyes and deceive us into thinking that we can still be light and darkness. He told them in the Old Testament, choose ye this day whom you're going to serve. Life or death, blessing and cursing, and God is still presenting a choice to humanity today. You are either going to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you're going to allow him to be the door and go in and find pasture, or you're going to turn and turn your heart away. And it's just a description. The day you hear his voice, harden not your heart. You're going to harden your heart to this truth. You're going to continue in sin because you love pleasures more than you love God. And you're going to get away from them and get away from the light and get them saints away from me. Because the Bible said men love darkness rather than light. You have to make that cautious choice, people of God. Whether you're going to be that light and that example. And whether you're going to walk in holiness. Or whether you're going to allow the enemy the prince of darkness to rule over your heart and send you to a devil's hell. But you have to ultimately make that choice. And we need to make sure that we have understanding. In verse 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. We still don't want to be found to be amongst sinners or to be called sinners. We don't want to be found a sinner, rather. It's okay if you go amongst them to share the light and try to help to win them, but you don't want to be out there doing what they do. There's something wrong with that picture. Verse 16 said, Know ye not that whom ye yield yourself servant to obey is servant you are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So wherever you yield yourself servant to obey, his servant you are to whom ye obey. So we have to be the light, and we have to obey and walk in the light as he is in the light. Allow the light to shine in your path and be saved. And he that endured to the end, the same should be saved. We need to make sure we're building up our most holy faith and enduring to the end that we may be saved. From here, we want to go to 1 John. Uh, 1 John, the fifth chapter. Picking up at verse 18 through 20, it says, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God has come, and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and that we are in him that is true. Even his Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. So the Bible lets us know that we know that if you're born of God, whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Just as the Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. He says, sin shall not have dominion over you. He says that with that temptation, God's going to make a way to escape, that she may be able to bear it. There's no temptation that's going to come to you that's not common to all men. All these scriptures are helping us to know and see the light that, that we shouldn't be giving in and yielding to sin. And that wicked one shouldn't be able to touch us. Is that if you're begotten of God, he keepeth himself. And we know that we're of God, and this whole world lieth in wickedness. We see what's going on in the world today. You can turn on the news, you can turn on the television, you try to watch a movie or, or listen to something on the radio, and there's all this wickedness that the world has lied before us to try to get us to fall away from the most holy faith. Brothers and sisters, we must be the light, dispel the darkness. Call it what it is and help others to come out that they too can be saved. And the last thing I want to share tonight, just by way um, even of encouragement, is that even in persecution, you want to make your light shine. Even when persecuted, you want your light to shine. And you need to know that the biggest enemy other than Satan himself 
Because the devil will try to trip you up. But after the devil, you know, you overcome your flesh and all these things, you're going to have the hypocrites. You're going to have the, the those just as the apostles had religious leaders in that day that had a problem with them because of the Jesus they served. And the scripture says that even the son Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Just for you to say that there is no other way but by Jesus will offend many that claim to know God or a higher power or those of other religions. You will offend by and by. But you're reproving the darkness. You're shining the light and trying to help them to see the truth. Steadfast. Be the light. Don't let them sway you or persuade you not to tell the truth. But I want to point out in this particular passage of scripture, because we talked about how the apostles were able to even overcome when they were threatened not to preach in Jesus' name and threaten, they continue to be the light anyway. I want to share, picking up um, Acts 5, verse 17. And uh, we should have enough time to read this in closing. Acts 5, 17, I'm going to read down. It says, Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is of the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them into common prison. So these men were upset because there were signs and wonders being done by the apostles. The multitudes were coming out. They were casting out devils. They were believing in Jesus. And some was hoping that Peter's shadow would overcome them so that they could be healed. And this bothered the Sadducees. It bothered the hypocrites, those that were wrong, to where they laid hands and they put them in a common prison. They wanted to... to, to put some fear in them. They had already caught them before and got on them and threatened them and beat them when you read the fourth chapter. And now in the fifth chapter, we find here that the apostles are suffering persecutions yet again. And they that should have godly should suffer persecution. Saints, we are not exempt. There's persecutions that are happening now and there are more severe ones that are coming. So we want you to be prepared to be light and build up your most holy faith so that you can stand in that evil day. But it says they put him in a prison. And verse 19 says, But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak at the temple to the people all the words of this life. So the angel of the Lord opened the prisons. And the angel of the Lord didn't open the prisons and say, Okay, now that you're free, go hide. Y'all go in the cave and just kind of keep that Bible study quiet and don't let everybody know. Put that light under a bushel. He told them, you need to go stand and speak in the temple all the words of life. You go out there and proclaim like you've been doing. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and talked. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they found them not in the prison. They returned and told, saying, the prison truly found we shut with all safety and the keeper standing without before the doors but when we had opened we found no man within <laughs> they said something didn't happen the the prison's locked the guards are there but when we went inside they know where to be found them men gone them people we just arrested are free now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things they doubted of them whereunto this would grow then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men which ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. So as they were thinking and pondering, somebody said, You know those guys you arrested them, people you were persecuting, you locked up? They back out here and they teaching the people. Even in persecution, saints of God, we still must be the light. Even at the threat of our lives, we still must be the light. Then with the captain, with the officers, and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. So he said, Didn't we tell you, didn't we command you not to preach in this name, not to share this thing? Now this was the, the high priest and, and some people in the council and all these they had title and prestige. And saints, we may be called on the carpet for some of our beliefs. They might say, yeah, you're a part of that church. Don't y'all believe in freedom from sin? 
Ain't that y'all over there talking about don't be speaking in tongues unless you got interpretation? Ain't that you? Ain't you one of them? You need to still be the light, even in persecution. And Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. And when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. See, now they got mad and now they want to kill them because they were still being the light and shared the truth. They were cutting through that darkness and it cut them in the heart. And as they were getting angry, they began to ponder on themselves what they should do. And there was a man named Galileo, which was the same Galileo that Paul had learned under. There was a part of their council that warned them to say, listen, you know, let these men alone. If this counsel or work be of men, it's eventually going to come to naught. It ain't going to be nothing. But he warned him in verse 39. He said, but if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. Lest happily you found even to fight against God. He said, if it's of God, you can't stop it no way. Because God, going, you be fighting against him, you ain't going to win. And if it's not of God, leave it be. And eventually it'll become nothing. It'll fall to naught. He even gave them some examples where that happened. But verse 40 says, and to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. They were beaten and threatened. They were told, don't teach in his name yet again. And the Bible says that not only did they depart rejoicing because they were worthy of the suffering of Jesus, but that they continued to share the word daily, both in the temple and from house to house. We're praying tonight, saints, that we can be so bold to continue to be the light, even in the midst of persecution, whether beaten or threatened, whether our lives are at stake, that we'll continue to be lights to this dying world and try to help win the loss at any cost. We're going to go ahead and close out in prayer. And, um... Let us be agreed right now. Father, we thank you, Lord. Lord, for the examples left on record for your people. We thank you, Holy Father, that, Lord, we're able to see, Father God, the apostles time and time again stand on your truth and not allow the enemy to cause them to back down. Lord, we see, Father God, examples in Stephen where he was gnashed on with their teeth and stoned, Father God, but he continued, Father God, to have the face of an angel and begs you not to lay this sin against their charge. Lord, we see examples time and time again, even when King Herod began to kill and slay James, Father God, with the sword and intended to kill Peter, Lord. Lord, we're seeing examples, Father God, of suffering for you, but Lord, they're standing boldly and sharing your word, Father God, unapologetically. And we pray right now in the name of Jesus that, Lord, you would help us, Father God, to have such boldness. Help us, Father God, Lord, to be able to be lights, Lord, and Lord, to allow those that we come across in our paths and various walks of life to see, Father God, the goodness of you, Father God, your love and your mercy and the fruits of the Spirit, that they too, Father, may want to get to know you in the free pardon of sin. We pray, Father God, that your Holy Spirit would give us words seasoned with grace as we begin to witness to our neighbors and, Lord, whoever we come across, that they may not be able to resist the wisdom from your word, but the Lord, they too, Father God, would submit humbly their will to your will. And Lord, we would be able to snatch some out of the very fire that the enemy is banking on trying to send to a devil's hell. We pray for this in the name of Jesus. Help us, Lord, to witness to our loved ones, Father God. Lord, to not be afraid if they may reject us or may be offended, Father God. But Lord, rather help us that we would rather obey you than to be worried about man. Lord, we just pray, Father, that you keep and watch over each and every one of us. Until we're able to come together again, may your Holy Spirit lead and guide us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. Amen. Amen. God bless you tonight, saints, is our prayer. Thanks again for tuning in to Church of God Mission YouTube Live. For more information, please visit us at cogmission.org. And if you'd like to be a part of this mission, please leave us a message so that we can contact you. And may the grace of God and sweet communion of His Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide in each heart until we meet again.